time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode number 232, Best 4x4 Adventures. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James Cleary, and joining me today to look at the most enjoyable, exotic, and at times arduous off-road expeditions we've ever undertaken, our key contributor and adventuring hero, Dave Morley. Oh, adventuring hero. I've, I've got a promotion. <laughs> and our fearless leader, Editor Mal Flynn, known to his mates as Malby Mangles. Mal- <laughs> <laughs> we'll, I'll pay that. <laughs> we'll also take a look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and unearth the comment of the week. YouTubers, you can jump ahead to each section of the show via the time codes in the notes or chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. Mal, look, I think it's fair to say we're in what are close to supporting roles today because, Dave, you've undertaken some epic adventures, sometimes on-road, off-road, two wheels, four, maybe other configurations, I don't know. Uh, but we're going to detail our most memorable 4x4 adventures, the vehicles, the locations, the people, the highlights, the lowlights. So, Dave, let's get straight into it. How are you going to kick us off? Well, look, I think the secret to, to off-road adventuring is just... Um have a really bad sense of direction you get lost a lot <laughs> you end up in some really interesting places yeah it, I, look i think um i'll go out on a limb here and suggest that in terms of um a country to see amazing things and to uh for for, for free camping gorilla camping there is no country on earth like australia Oh, and no. I sound like I should be wearing a Irwin Zoo uniform when I say that, but it's true. Um, it, it, Crikey. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I've done a bit of this stuff around the world. It's not the same. It, this, this country is fantastic in terms of what you can, what you can actually get away with, where you can camp and, and, and what you can see. So um, I think we're in the pound seats to start with, and, and, which leads me to my, my second statement, which is a bit of a bald one, which is if you don't get out there and see it, um, you're missing out. You really are. You're a bit of a mug, you know, unless, you know, unless you've got absolutely no interest in it. And, and I challenge people on that because, um, you know, I often hear people say, oh, I drove across the Nullarbor. It was boring. Three days of nothing. They're not paying attention. You know, there's tons of stuff going on out there and there's, there's heaps of things to see. Uh, you've just got to stop and smell the roses a little bit. And, um, and, you know, that's, that's an amazing drive across Australia. So, and it's easy too. Like it's so yeah. well populated with traffic and trucks and mm. things like that and roadhouses. There's no shortage of petrol. It takes very little planning. The yeah. road surface is outstanding, but right next to you is, you know, that shoreline around um, wherever it is and the pathway along it. Um, but on the other side is red dirt. Yeah. 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 What's, yeah. What's the problem with this? And you're right. And it's been sealed since 1975 or something. So there's, you know, you can, you can take your Nissan Micra across country if you, if you wanted to. Yeah. And, and there's also, no reason not to. I've when you first a start to see, them. when you first start to see that magnificent 360 degree horizon, you know, you the or what do you call it, a big sky. That's mm. where you really start to breathe a little more easily and and yeah. uh, take a different approach to things. For me, that's usually about um, the other side of Griffith in New South Wales because I I tend to go up through that way, uh-huh. and uh, and you start to see the curvature of the Earth. Um, exacerbated, I would point out, by the rice farmers who have used laser levels to <laughs> to make right. their, to make their right. bodies just a little bit more efficient, which is which is bitten them in the backside a little bit lately with the floods because once you laser level a piece of ground, there's no runoff, so they stay flooded for weeks. Cool. So, Dave, what wow. about what about some of the 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 tracks that are like arteries off there, like up into the top of the? I'm thinking of the uh, stress uh, What am I saying? Stress lecky track stress-lecky, and, yeah. and various other ones. Have, yeah, you, have you had an attack on, on those ones? Yeah, yeah, I've been up all through there. Um, the other thing I'd say too is I, I reckon I have a rule where the outback starts, <laughs> and that's um, usually about day two. Um, right. And the rule is when passing cars coming the other way start waving, yes. you're in the outback. <laughs> uh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's about Marrickville. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people well, start waving there, but for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, look, there's some really well trodden tracks, and you can um, you can go to some pretty remote places and still be fairly sure that you're going to see someone coming the other way, or someone will roll in behind you in a day's time if there's a problem. So, which doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to actually get it right and do it yes. properly, but it's a lot safer than it was when uh, you know um, they were using camels. 
But that's a, it's an interesting pointer, isn't it? That it's not only a landscape change, but an attitudinal change in the people that you're, you're kind of traveling these, these places with, that, that they're, you're all in it together and that sense of, um, oh, is it camaraderie or, or just common purpose, I suppose? Oh, no, there's definitely, there's definitely a sense of, of you're in a club, you know, and it's yeah. a secret society and the, yeah. the, rest, the rest of the mugs are back home in the city, you know, slapping it to work on the bus and you're not. Yeah, uh, and you're only about eight hours away from happy hour. So <laughs> yeah. So if, if if you were talking to someone who hadn't, you know, been out there, they but they're confident enough to take on a reasonably challenging uh, trip. It's over, you know, a week or more, uh, mm. and they're starting out. Maybe they're starting out from uh, Melbourne or Sydney. Where would you head them? Where would you send them? It depends what they're driving. Um, okay. And and. You know, it really comes down to that because if if it's just a road car, there's still plenty of places to see. You know, you can get right out to White Cliffs, you can get out to Broken Hill, no problems without leaving the bitumen. Um, and and they're all fantastic places. If if Perth, Perth, well, exactly right. You know, exactly. Not that the middle of Perth, the outback, but you go. But oh, some might say once you're once you're in Perth. Yeah. Um, the 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 you know the wheat fields and the gold fields are are all within striking range. Of a, of a normal two-wheel drive car and it, it's fantastic out there yeah uh, if you are tooled up with it with a bit of equipment and some camping gear and you don't mind doing that then your world just opens up um, true true yeah. it's interesting you mentioned western australia but coming from the top of western australia and you are in that very red dirt kind of country and you get to the pointy out bit around Geraldton, and you go south of there and it becomes lush kind of dairy country you almost turn like just a blink of an eye and you're into an entirely different landscape. Well, I mean, I say this to people, I'll be driving along, a, you know, a, a road out in the absolute middle of nowhere, just red dirt and, and you watch it. And every time you go over a ridge, the, the country changes. Yes. It's amazing. The, the landscape changes, the, the sky changes, the clouds change, the, the, the scrub changes. It's just phenomenal. And, and the fauna, sorry, yeah. the fauna, the good old Aussie well, fauna. I'm, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for all that stuff. Yes. Uh, particularly the fauna, because I've, I've got an aluminium bull bar, not a steel one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but, you know, a, a great example of, of that is um, the drive from Melbourne out to, um, I often go out to Lake Gairdner for the salt flat races. And, and I'll, it's a two-dayer in my truck because it doesn't go very fast. Um, and I stop at Burra. And that drive from oh. Melbourne to Burra is just epic. Yeah. And you travel through the, through the riverland. Um, if you if you've got time, you don't have to go over the bridge. You can jump on one of the many ferries that cross the Murray around Berry there, places like that. Uh, it's just an awesome day out, and you know I defy anybody to to tell me that they'd rather sit at home, you know, in front of a TV screen. Fabulous. And, and so this doesn't require flying flying anywhere. You can hop in your car that's in your driveway right now, yep. and see the best in the world. Wow. Absolutely. And and you know, like I say, it is it is the best in the world. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, we've got the climate. We've got the you know. If you've you often see at campsites, you know the the, and I'm not using this as a disparaging term, but the grey nomads will all be there, and they'll they'll have their three ton caravans, and they'll they'll have encircled the toilet block. Wow, <laughs> yes, that's right. but I, I don't tow a trailer. I don't I don't like towing anything. I find it limits me too much. So I'll I'll I might prop up at the same campsite, and there's some great free campsite books out there too. Grab one of those, um, and but I'll I'll scoot around the back and go through the gully that their three ton caravan can't go through, and I'll be over the back near the gorge where the kangaroos are hopping around, still within cooey of everyone, but um, yes. I can't hear their generators. But Dave, just to put your you know putting Australia on the on the top step of the podium is fantastic, but just. Just give us a quick thumbnail of some of those very big uh, overseas motorcycle trips that you did, just from, from where to where, just so that we know what we're competing against. Oh, well, um, the first one I did um, was to the Isle of Man, uh, and I bought a, an eBay motorbike off out of London, just off eBay. And uh, there were four of us, and we, um, we bought three motorbikes, and we went back to England after the Isle of Man, after we'd gone stupid there for about 10 days, and then rode to Syria. Via, yes. via across yeah. Turkey, across Greece, across Turkey, and into Syria, and then back up through Romania and Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> so there's some interesting stuff there, um, yeah. but that gave us a taste for it. And and then we got serious, and we built bikes here. And we took, and this was in 90, uh, 2013, we took them to Greece, shipped them into Greece, and then we rode across the Silk Road. So Turkey, all the all the stands, Afghanistan, uh, not Afghanistan, yep. 
uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, you, know, you name it, we've stand it. The stands. Uh, into Russia, across Mongolia, back into Russia, across Siberia, down to Vladivostok, and we shipped home out of there. Awesome. So that was, um, awesome. that was a three-monther. And yeah. that was um, everything you needed for three months was on your motorbike. Yes. Yes. Including having your wits about you. Oh, I left my wits at home. I wasn't. <laughs> my, mate did. my mate definitely did. We went to the airport to start this epic journey and we got through security. And I said, where's your helmet? <gasps> oh! oh. <laughs> he left it on the conveyor belt at security. Nice. Now, how, I mean, we should have been shot at that point, but we got away with it. And that's the thing. That's I keep coming back to this when I tell people this stuff. It's amazing what you'll get away with. Um, right, right. You know, we, we had border checks. We had a lot of police checks. We had our bikes stripped at borders. We had six-hour border crossings. We had um, times when we we should have um, we should have declared that we had uh, headache tablets or, 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 uh, or altitude. Oh yeah, tablets. yeah, yeah. Some right. Countries demand it. Some don't. We didn't know. We didn't. We got propped up there while they while they burnt our altitude sickness um, medication. Um, yeah, it, it's just it was crazy. But but in every case. Um, you you have the opportunity when you when you're stopped by these people who and let's face it, a lot of them are heavily armed. Um, you have the opportunity to either pass or fail the attitude test. Yes. And even though you may not speak the language, yes. facial expressions count for a lot. Sure. Uh, and uh, I always find um, I don't smoke, but I always carry a few packets of cigarettes, and that that can that can uh, be a real icebreaker too. Awesome. Awesome. I think also Australian plays a part, being, being Australian plays a part, uh, potential just to be a little bit jingoistic about it. When uh, I heard uh, Richard Feidler, who's an ABC broadcaster, uh, I think nationally uh, on the ABC, talking about being in Russia uh, pre-end of Cold War. So, you know, he's in a fairly exotic location. And he was trying to convince a soldier uh, that he wasn't American. And um, he said, oh, kangaroo. And he was doing all of these kind of things to try and prove. And then he goes, Kylie Minogue. What about Kylie? Oh. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the soldier goes, Kylie Minogue, Kylie Minogue, lucky, lucky, lucky. And he, <laughs> he, <laughs> she'd got through the, the Iron Curtain um, into Russia. So, anyway, that, that you've got, you got to hope that the guy's, the guy's a Kylie fan, though, don't that you? Played, well, true. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be. Who knows? That well, played very well for him. So, okay, Mal. Well, thank sorry, you. I'll, just, I'll just pull you up on that because yeah. I, I think that used to be the case, but I've taken all my Aussie flags off everything now. Yes, um, right. Just, I reckon post Howard, yeah, post bit of a change. Era, uh, it did change, and it okay. has changed. And I prefer now to be non-identifiable. I mean, you know, some of these countries you you roll into, yes, um, you're a big you're a big white guy on a big motorcycle, you stand out. Mm -hmm. So so you're already foreign. Mm. Um, I prefer not to be identified these days. And the only time it's really backfired on me um, having anything like that, um, I was in turkey and i was staying at the at the at the um um clubhouse of a istanbul motorcycle club they, wow, they let us great. they let us um use their clubhouse and they had a garage and we had access to tools and it was great because the bikes were a bit second hand by the time i got there istanbul banditos uh, istanbul bikers they're called oh, istanbul, istanbul bikers. bikers okay uh and so so we were there and one of them gave me a, a present before we left and it was a little uh it was a key fob and a little um turkish flag about not even postage stamp size. And I stuck that on the speedo of my motorbike. And then we kept going and we, we're going east. And I ended up in the Kurdish part of oh, I see. Turkey. I see. And I came out one morning there. This is, this is almost on the Iranian border. I came out there uh, one morning and the little sticker had been um, pulled off and my front tire had been slashed. Yeah. I and see. so and that I taught see. me a lesson. Don't, right. don't, don't play on that. Don't hitch your horse to any particular brand. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Great Just story. Be a, tra be a traveler. Don't be, don't be an agnostic. agnostic. Yeah, yes. Exactly right. <clears throat> thank you, Dave. That's People it. That's are likely it. to respect that. That's incredible. Mm. Um, thank you. D uh, Mal, Dave spoke about, you know, the big sky country. You've seen that through the windscreen of your car as its attitude changed, um, <laughs> having been launched off a particular natural ramp. Um, <laughs> Is, I presume that's going to be part of your your story. <laughs> this has got to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah, what a setup. Jeez, I was going to say, I was presuming that Dave was going to go straight to the Silk Road uh, and and introduce mine by saying a bit close to worth, and then you have me in the air. Um, <clears throat> but I uh, 
interesting that Dave has, has, has gone with Australia and, and, you know, the, the greatest adventure is at your front door. Um, Cause I've done the same and uh, I'm going to nominate uh, Stockton beach North of Sydney as you know, my greatest off-road adventure. And I've done lots of stuff uh, around yep. the world, not as much as Dave, but uh, yep. all sorts of terrains. But uh, so Stockton Beach is just north of Newcastle. It's a 32-kilometre long stretch of beach, one is kilometre it 32 deep. 32 k's? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's a big beach. Mm. And I'm not a Star Wars fan, but um, it reminds me of that scene where they're in the desert where it's just sand. The and sand people. It's an, it's an alien environment. It's just yeah, amazing. Easily, they'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was Star Wars too. I'm getting the right. Uh, yeah, I think you are. Right yes. franchise. Great. Yep. Uh, so yeah, one kilometre deep, and you know, it, it's just to be surrounded by sand, nothing but sand, and yeah. dunes. You know, thirty metres high. You know, beyond, just mountains of sand. You know, and and to the point where they can even block your view of the ocean. Um, it's pretty awesome. Anyway, great four wheel driving, great adventuring really accessible from Sydney. Uh, I first discovered it on a school excursion um, and it took me years to, to get back there in a four-wheel drive, but uh, it's somewhere where you can have fun in anything that's all-wheel drive, really, as long as you're careful about it. And if, if you approach from the northern end, uh, you can do it in, in anything and drive to the water and have a lot of fun. Um, I would uh, urge anyone... <laughs> Just put a t- putting a toe in the water to avoid the dunes, though. Anything with plastic cladding is likely to leave it behind if you play in the dunes. I see. Uh, but it's just an amazing place. And, um, you know, for 30 bucks at the Servo, you, can, you get a three-day pass. I think it's about 30 bucks. Um, I've been there twice this year. Um, it's accessible, you know, as a day trip for anyone from Sydney. Yep. And it's it's easy on the car as well. It's, you know, you don't don't take a driving in the I salt water. I had a, had a fang through there with a um, like a tourist provider that has a Humvee. So oh, you, right. pay, the big... you pay your money and you can uh, you can do a bit of a tour around the dunes in one of those. It's a, it's a bus bodied H1. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, just amazing. And it was, you know, it was more fun when you had access to the entire beach and they've, they've clamped down on that in recent years for conservation reasons. And, yep. you know, a lot of idiots have left rubbish there over decades. Gotcha. Uh, but it's still an amazing place to visit. And, you've, you know, you've got, ex, they've, they keep you in a, a recreational area these days and yep. you can just have a lot of fun. And um, now speaking of fun, Mel, it was a Holden badge Japanese product that uh, cre- generated the most fun. Fill us in on that bit. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I, uh, the, the full drive I borrowed was a Holden Drover. I ended up buying that Drover, uh, which is a, Suzuki, a Holden badge Suzuki Sierra. And uh, first time I went there, we had, I think there was about eight of us in a two-seat vehicle, just taking turns, playing on the sand in this thing. Um, just just great fun, you know? Yeah. Cheap, great fun. And, um, you know, there's there's uh, other cool things, you know, like there used to be a, a shipwreck, uh, the Cigna that had been there since 1974. Yeah. Uh, so it was always, you know, we'll go see the shipwreck. Um, and it's slowly degraded over, you know. I think it was, I think it was largely washed away fairly recently. Yeah, it's gone yeah. Further and, out. Uh, well, I actually spotted it this year in uh-huh. low tide. You can just make it out. Okay. Um, you've really got to know where to look. But yeah, for those who know what they're looking for, can can find it. But also, about a third of the way uh, up the beach, there's a there's a, like a a shanty town called Tin City. I think it's a fisherman's village, and you know, I can't imagine sleeping there. Imagine brushing your teeth in the sand and all that sort of stuff. But but you know, little cool things to check out on the on the way. Um, just lots of fun, and it's right next to Sydney. Great, great, brilliant. All right, that's superb. Thank you, Mel. Um, I, I'm going to talk about my uh, off road four by four and more um, adventure. It was the late 1980s. Uh, it was my first actual full time job, and I was working for Mercedes Benz um, in Milpera in Sydney. Bit of PR, bit of advertising, bit of sales promotion. Uh, and now it's pretty sure it was the Austral Brickworks in Horsley Park, which is in Western Sydney. And they had a materials pit, you know, dirt, sand, clay, as well as wooded areas and steep inclines, the whole bit. So the business had a very proactive commercial vehicle uh, salesperson who was mad for tenders. You know, he was always pitching in Mercedes-Benz product for tenders. Um, and consequently, he needed to build relationships. So he would have, we would set up a day and invite 
all kinds of mobs like fire authorities, police rescue, local government, utilities like electricity, railway. Um, there was a lot going on with the military at that stage, but that was more a national thing. And it was just a come to this brick works, we'll have a barbecue lunch and we can all play in this big sand pit with our range of, you know, off highway products that can be bodied for all kinds of purposes, you know, with cranes on the back or semi-ag kind of applications and whatever. And the lineup that we had was absolutely brilliant. We had a six by six V-series, like rigid cab over truck, and it had super single type balloon tires on, on it, but with chains on the tires as well. I remember, I don't remember what the Is that engine a Unimog? Was. No, no, look, we'll get to that. Oh, but I think okay. uh, it had an Allison Auto. I remember it was a, a, an automatic. Um, it would go up and over just about anything. It was incredible. We had the LA911B, which was an incredibly versatile, unbreakable old school uh, 4x4 bonneted truck. It had a 5.7 litre diesel six that developed 130 horsepower. But it would go anywhere. We had G-Wagons. So the 230 uh, petrol and the 300 diesel G-Wagon, we had Unimogs. Uh, you mentioned it, Mal, the, the U1700. And uh, we also had MB Track, uh, which was at that stage, the Mercedes-Benz uh, tractor. tractor. Uh, and we had them of various sizes. And we we're having a crack at everything. It was absolutely amazing. The, the Unimog was unstoppable. Um, the, the six by six was incredible. And I, I got into all these things as a junior burger and had a massive play with them all. It was really fantastic. But it kind of became a bit of a big swinging tender contest, if you know what I mean. These people started to try and outdo each other, attempting ridiculous inclines and, you know, really challenging stuff. And um, I got uh, a bit kind of uh, overwhelmed and stepped to one side. My job from there was to just videotape everything we had a little this is how long ago it was we had a vhsc little porter pack camera and one of the mb tracks and the thing about the mb tracks they had equal size wheels these tractors and you could have a power takeoff there was a power takeoff at the front and at the back and you could also have something in the middle so you could actually do three different operations in one pass so if you're a farmer you could increase your efficiency and you could have all different kinds of wheel and tire combinations on it so you do row cropping or big floaty tires so you don't compact the ground or whatever you want to do. This one on that day had a thing that I dubbed the Greenies Nightmare on the front of it, which is it was a massive rotating drum with little hammers that flew out of it and a push bar on top of that. So you just went up to a tree of actually amazing girth, cut, used this drum to cut through it, push the tree over and turn it into wood chips under the, under the tractor as you went forward. So here I am uh, videoing and I'm looking up at this tree and the tractor doing all this tricky kind of camera work. And I'm looking through the, oh, that tree's kind of falling towards me. And you just see this whole, the camera kind of goes crazy. Like when the, um, the camera comes off the car and I nearly videoed my own death. It was, <laughs> it was about to, it was about to fall on me. And it was only realizing in the nick of time that I stood aside, but those, those days were absolutely huge fun. Did you send the tape into Funniest Home Videos? No, no. Fail no chance to, to win a Lex in Newport. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great just to watch the psychology of the day progress. Everybody turned up, you know, very formal, great. Hello, pleased to meet you, whatever. Um, but by the end of the day, it's like, watch this. Just get a load, like the lean angle on the G Series where you're thinking it's going to tip any second. They didn't. Nothing untoward happened. Um, yeah. And... We did well subsequently in a lot of tenders. It was a very canny move and uh, people were able to get in there and kind of get their hands dirty. So bottom line, look out for any brickworks that might be closing down and familiarise yourself with ex-defence auction oh, look, houses. It, it, was, it was absolutely perfect. It was such a good location. You had every surface imaginable wow. um, and you could go. It, in fact, it did the brick uh, company a favour because you were clearing bits of ground that they had to clear anyway. Um, yeah, it was unreal. It was brilliant. And in fact, the, the company had some very experienced four-wheel drivers and they started to give you a bit of tuition. So it was the first taste, I suppose, of, of doing anything off-road and you operating diff locks and seeing what, what does what to what vehicle it was great. Really good. I had a, I had a similar experience. Um, I, I had a day to kill in, in Vegas once and there was a, there was a, a New Zealand guy who in the, after the 
financial crash in 08, 09, he went around to all these building companies in America and he bought all, the, they'd gone broke. So he bought all their equipment, diggers and bulldozers. Oh, you're then kidding. He, then he bought, a, he bought a mini golf course in Las Vegas <laughs> and you could go there and dig holes. Unreal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, fire a 25 ton excavator for an hour just to have a play. It was fantastic. That's awesome. Oh. That's fantastic. I would sign up for that. I've wanted an excavator ever since, but I haven't, I'm not allowed to have one. <laughs> I did that in Christchurch once uh, with time to spare, and I drove a Centurion tank. Oh, right, but that, same that, thing. that wasn't sanctioned in any way, was it, Mel? You'd acquired that tank through. <laughs> I was just sitting there. there. No one, no one was using it. it was, oh, give it I know. I made, I made the news globally. I, I, yes. All right. So that is that's our uh, that's our four by four adventures. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. We will and sometimes six by six, six by six, and one one by two. Yeah, that, that would be a uh, motorcycle. <laughs> so we are going to move from all of that to our garage. And Mal, can I start with you, please? What is it that you've been driving lately that you might like to share with our audience? Well, coincidentally, I'm bang on theme here. Um, I've finally driven the 76 Series Land Cruiser, the, the wagon-bodied 70 Series. Uh, and it's taken me 15 years to do it. Um, so this is wagon as opposed to troop carrier. This is yeah, your, your wagon. so yep. four door wagon, shorter wheelbase than all the others uh, at the moment, um, and you know what, on paper seems to be the closest thing to the original Range Rover um, available now, um, and in a package that's arguably less likely to fall apart than original Range Rover. Controversial. Anyway, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, the original Range Rover, That's right. you know, there's some, there's decades of established uh, patterns there. Truth is a defense. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so it was the 70th anniversary edition, which uh, comes with a few extra niceties, you know, this, the uh, the 40 series echoing grill and a few 70s, um, 70th anniversary badges and such. Okay. Um, but that car is a, have you driven it, Dave? No, I've driven, I've driven. Uh, plenty of 70 series, but not the 76. I really like the look of it. Oh, look, yes, size, shape, everything. Yeah, it just makes yeah. so much sense, doesn't it? And, you know, available brand new. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, it's it's smaller than the, the 200 and 300, you know. Well, I mean, the it's, Prado. it's kind of the spiritual successor to, to, to my rig. I've got an 80 series Land Cruiser. Now, you could argue that it's the grandfather of the 200 and the, th the current 300 series. But, I mean, they've gone a lot more, you know, comfort oriented and stuff whereas the old 80 series was still live axles at both ends similar to what i think the 76 series represents so yeah i mean i've, I've looked at those and gone mm, that could be my next truck you know mm. yeah. and my understanding is the front end is lifted directly from the the 80 series oh, um, yeah i mean it's 78 series but yeah 79 series but it's you know it's the concept is live axles mm. uh, core sprung live axles so you know the the, the concept is very similar Mm. Yeah. Still leaves on the rear, though, interestingly. Yeah, yeah. That, um, yeah. They did have a version with coils on the back. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's, where, that's where the Prado badge originated. Exactly. Anyway, exactly. Uh, so it's taken me 15 years to drive this thing. Dave still hasn't, amazingly. Um, but this car is a philosophical fruit salad um, in that you hop in it and you think, oh, crikey, $80,000 for this? Yeah. You don't have a reversing camera. From the A-pillar backwards, it's... You know, it's all circa 1984. There's nothing about it, save for, you know, stability control under the under the skin. Um, yes. But, yeah, $78,000 for the 70th anniversary edition. Um, 38 years old from the A-pillar back. Um, the cabin's really narrow by modern standards. So the back seat, you know, it's fine for two, but three is a squeeze. Um, you know, you get the offset driving position you get with any 70 series, uh, the pedals and steering wheel, et cetera. Um, for some reason, the wagon is cheaper than the Ute versions. I haven't worked out why. Okay. Um, but, and, you know, people are buying these because they love them. But, uh, you know, the, the, there is a, an abyss between it and a Prado for similar money um, in terms of, you know, comfort, safety. Yeah. Uh, it's all about purpose, purpose yeah. and intent, really, isn't it? Yeah. But for me, I, 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 would have a, I would have a real hard time justifying that I, I, I can't recommend that vehicle to other people and the 79 series is the same purely on the basis of safety yeah, yeah right and you know 
yeah. the I think it's the single cab that has a five star rating. Yeah, it's only the single cab. Yeah, but, you know, the, it's a rating. They're, although they're reclassifying it, I think uh, later this year. But you know, as a light truck, um, but the existing rating is is you know seven or so years old. Yeah. Um. So you know, against standards that are out of date. Um. Uh, but the argument for this car is that people are spending a fortune on restored 40 series Land Cruisers, uh, not to mention unrestored 60 and 80 series Land Cruisers. Yep. And here's your chance to buy con- the magic of Great. a lot of the magic Great. in those. Very brand good. new. Very good. Very brand good. new for Very similar good. money with a five-year warranty. Very good. So, yeah, I think your metal, if you buy one, is your sole vehicle, but you're buying a lot of what, uh, a lot of the magic that's made the Toyota brand Brand new, out of the box. Super. I don't, I don't understand people who buy a, a very cap- off-road capable vehicle as their only vehicle anyway. I mean, it's mm, just yeah. horrible. And that 80 series of mine, you can just see it in the background there behind the what's left of that charger. Um, I, I only ever use that when I'm going away. I don't drive it around town very at good. all because it would drive me nuts. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, Mel. I'm glad that you've achieved that ambition after a decade and a half. That's fabulous. Now, Dave, what is it that you have been driving uh, recently that you might like to share? Well, speaking of $80,000 off-roaders, um, I've been right. driving the, the, the new Amarok. Oh, um, okay. Which the uh, would be up now, I should think. Um, the W580X? W580X, which is the, the Walkinshaw Group yep. modified Volkswagen Amarok V6. Now, in the past, they've modified them to be better on-road. Yep. This one is designed to be next level off-road um so they've added uh new dampers um uh, twin tube dampers uh it's got pirelli scorpion tires it's got rock sliders it's got bash plates it's it's lifted a little at the front um it's all designed to make it this this cutting edge off-road i'm not sure that it that it does um the v6 amarok's a very capable off-roader in the first place right yeah I think largely this is a, and I hate to say it, but I think it's mainly a window dressing exercise. Well, yeah, you will oh. you will appreciate rock sliders in the Victorian high country. You will appreciate bash plates in dunes, and you know the tires will speak for themselves. Uh, and the shocks, if you if you're on the Gibb River Road pounding across 300 kilometres of corrugations uh, for for a day, you you know the shocks will come into their own. But I'm not sure that it makes it any. Uh, any more usable day to day, right? Have they have they gone for the RM Williams mud flaps and a Longhorn sticker no. on the back window? No, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's different. I mean, there is a lot. Of, there is a lot of uh, walk that that mood about it, and, and you know it's embossed into the seats and all that. Got stuff. it. Got but it. but it's an eighty grand dual cab U at yeah. that point, you know. Yeah. And I, yeah. I that's the other thing I wonder about, you know. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, that, that is terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We'll we will continue moving. Um, I'm going to finish off uh, with an entirely different kind of vehicle, a Mazda 2. Uh, <laughs> not, not an off-road uh, weapon by any description. It's the Pure SP, $23,690. It's a 1.5 litre Atmo petrol, four six-speed auto, 82 kilowatts, 144 newton metres. Read it in a week, all through the front wheels. Now, the pluses are that I think this is still a good-looking car, and um, it, it, this one's finished in a paint called Platinum Quartz. It's like a soft champagne kind of color. I re- it's just totally subjective. I really like it. But it's still very uh, space efficient inside, uh, especially the rear. You can't believe how comfortably you can sit. Um, I'm six foot tall and I can sit in there with headroom and legroom ample. Um, it's composed dynamically, gets along pretty well uh, for that 1.5. Uh, 5.2 litres per 100 uh, in terms of consumption. You get alloys, um, um, you know, crews, a few different things for your low $20,000 price point. The minus is it is absolutely getting on. You know, you, you drive the car, you get in it. When the first few minutes you're going, ah, okay, no auto headlights, you get spoiled. So there's no auto headlights, but they are LED headlights, but um, no digi speedo. Uh, the media screen's really small. You do have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it's this tiny little media screen. No center armrest, no tie downs in the boot. Um, I also noticed that um, the sport setting, you can have a sport setting, which adjusts your, your shift points and whatever. It's quite aggressive. It's a fairly unsophisticated thing. But overall, I enjoyed it. It, it, it kind of lives in the space where cars like the, the Polo, which is moving up market, has, has vacated. It's, um, 
It's been around a while. I also learned that you do get monstered in a small car. I forgot how disrespectful people are of small cars. You're finding, God, why are you doing that? Oh, that's right. I'm in a Mazda too. Um, but uh, I, I did enjoy the experience and I, I think it's still a good looking car and, and reasonable value at that, at that money. So here's the thing. I disagree with, oh, well, you know, I don't think it's poor value, but I really loved that car when it was 17 grand. Oh, okay. And yep. it, was, it was a great car at 17 grand. I think it's probably an okay car at 23. Fair call. And as a manual, like how good were they? How good are they as a manual? Yeah, it's got all the, the Mazda getting the fundamentals right for yep. you know, shift feel and, and et cetera. Okay. All right. No, that's cool. Fair call. Fair call. Did, did yours have all the safety stuff you'd expect of a... It's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, okay. pretty good on that front. Good. So it's it's been you know it's kept pace reasonably well um, on that front. So yeah, but take the, your point, take your point, Dave. The thing about the two though, and and Mal, you're right. They got they get the important stuff right. Like even when it was brand new, that car with the, once it got the six speed auto, it was the pick of the little cars in automatic form. It was absolutely head and shoulders above the rest of them. It's dynamically the so of, good. The rest of the world's caught up a little bit. Um, yeah. but, you know, fundamentally, it's still a yeah. good package. All right, that's good. Now, speaking of feedback, um, it's time for comment of the, uh, comment of the week. Um, it is on top of the container in the uh, front of the forecourt, uh, surrounded by balloons, bunting, etc. cetera. Um, now, Lofty Visions. We, we, last week, we were talking about your most useless features. We came up with our 10 most useless features. Uh, and Lofty says, wouldn't it be great if manufacturers offered a competence pack uh, option? Um, maybe that's a bit uh, discriminatory. You might call it pure pack or something would be my idea at a lower price point that deleted all the unnecessary driver assist features that dumb down the art of driving. Doesn't seem fair. We should all get slugged for other people's inattention or lack of basic skills. I'd quite happily spend the savings on useful upgrades like more performance, better wheels, etc. or dare I say a sunroof, because actually a sunroof was one of the things we thought was useless. Oh, and auto stop start should have been at the top of your list the most irritating and useless modern car feature known to man. And then Gaz501 came in on the back of that and said, hmm, very limited market at resale time, uh, which I thought was a fair call, but an interesting point of view uh, from Lofty. How do you determine who gets to buy the car with the delete? Precisely. It makes a salesperson's job just a nightmare. How, how are you going to how are you going to determine who's, a good driver? who's got the confidence back? <laughs> and everyone's hand goes up precisely. But uh, nice idea, and I get where you're coming from, Lofty, 100%. Um, now, with that, we've reached the finish line. So it's time to say thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And thank you, Mel. Thank you very much, James and David. And thanks to our production, Mr. Fixit, former child and kicker ginger day victim, even though he's not a ginger, uh, Mr. Pritchard, for his commitment to the Cars Guide podcast cause. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, if you met my family, you'd understand. Um, green wall living pants and tartan mop shoes. Jump into the conversation. Cars Guide's on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. Thank you. And viewers, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go... My hamster's been really aggressive lately. Happens every time he gets behind the wheel. Oh.